that purports to show key details of the Moscow, Idaho killings. Legendary homicide detective Phil Waters and I break it down. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. About to say comes with a big caveat. Okay, a very big disclaimer. There is this video that has circulated online. We cannot verify it. We cannot verify the accuracy of it. We cannot say if it is real. We do not know if it is accurate. However, and making that very clear, as we will explain, there are details of this video that are consistent with what authorities have said in the Moscow, Idaho killings. And because of that, we just can't ignore the video. So I am talking about the killings of University of Idaho students Madison Mogan, Zana Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, and Kaylee Gonsalves. They were all found dead in an off-campus rental home back in November of 2022. Brian Koberger, a then 28-year-old PhD criminology grad student who had been studying at Washington State University, was arrested, charged, ultimately indicted by a grand jury for first-degree murder and burglary charges. Prosecutors tied him to the crime through cell phone data, DNA on a knife sheath left at the scene, potential eyewitness, and surveillance footage. Surveillance footage of a what appears to be, or what prosecutors say and authorities say, is a white Hyundai Elantra they say was at or near the house on King Road the night of the killings and on previous occasions. And let's talk about that for a second. So the car was spotted on several cameras passing the King Road home four times between 3.29 a.m. and 4.04 a.m. on the night of the killings and then speeding away 16 minutes later. Then the car they have on tape leaving the Washington State University campus at 2.44 a.m. They capture it headed towards Moscow. Then at 5.25 a.m., the cameras show it returning to Washington State University. By the way, a little bit later on in the afternoon, they track the phone associated with Brian Koberger to an Albertsons grocery store, and you see Koberger exit the white Hyundai Elantra. That's on tape. Now, we haven't seen it yet, but this is what prosecutors say they have. Not only that, but after the killings, a Washington State University officer spotted a white Hyundai Elantra in the parking lot of an apartment complex near campus. The car came back registered to Brian Koberger, and then Koberger and his father drove that 2015 white Hyundai Elantra from Washington to Pennsylvania in the weeks before his arrest. In fact, Koberger was pulled over by law enforcement twice on that trip out to Indiana for speeding and tailgating. But now you have the backstory of why that's all important. Let's talk about this video online. So this video has been up for several months, and it appears to be surveillance footage from a nearby house or property on Linda Lane, which is adjacent or across the street from King Road. Again, that's where the rental house is, the crime scene. We are not sure where this video came from. We do not know if it is a leak. We can't confirm it if it's real. I hope I made that clear. What we can say is that it has a lot of people talking, and I will tell you, it is fascinating. It is fascinating, particularly if it's all true. So I brought on legendary homicide detective Phil Waters to discuss this video. Let's check it out. All right, so let me bring in legendary homicide detective Phil Waters to talk about this. For those of you who don't know, Phil and I have been following the Koberger case from the very beginning, even before there was an arrest, Phil. That's when I think you and I first linked up. Uh, good to see you. Welcome yeah. back to Sidebar. Um, so again, to be clear... This video hasn't been verified. We believe it's from Linda Lane that is adjacent or across from King Road where this house was. It's been, this video has been circulating online. It's been on for several months. We're gonna play a few moments from it uh, that people are talking about online. But again, we're not 100% sure what this video is. Again, it's being very popular online, but let's just take it for what it is. So first up, first time stand I want timestamp I want to play is it's going to be 4.05.30 a.m. And now to be clear, as we play this, this they believe the killings happened at around this time, between 4 and 4.25 a.m. is when prosecutors say the killings happened. So let's play 4.05.30 a.m.
So to be clear, saying that's it. Is is that the car? Is that the white Hyundai Elantra that was been linked to Brian Koberger? Because we know in the probable cause affidavit from Koberger's arrest, they say suspect vehicle number one can be seen entering the area a fourth time at approximately 4.04 a.m. That video, if this is real, would be consistent with that. What do you think? Well, it would be. I, I guess the questions I have is an unverified video, as you've clearly stated. What I see in that video is a bunch of headlights. I don't see it unless somebody else is seeing something I'm not. I don't see a white Elantra. In fact, I don't even really, I cannot distinguish a shape of the vehicle itself. It's from the movement of the headlights, it looks like, yeah, they're making a three-point turn, that kind of thing. So it would be, if, if we're assuming that this is real and it is that time and it is that particular movement of that vehicle, then yeah, I mean, there's a certainly a great possibility that that's going to be the Elantra that's going to and, be the car. And to be clear, we don't know what the videos are. I mean, they've talked about surveillance footage. We just don't know what it is. If that is it, if from this Linda Lane, <clears throat> yeah, I agree with you. I don't think it's enough. They have to have known it was something else. They have to have been able to identify a white Hyundai Elantra from some other corroborating video because um, that in and of itself can't be it. There must be some other surveillance that they have um, other than that, right? Oh, yes, I, I think so. I think what you're going to find here, I think we said from the very beginning of this thing, in terms of what they're going to be doing at the initial investigation, at that starting point, is to canvas that area and find any video that they can capture in that time frame and, and before it and after, of course. Right. And so I think we did, think at the beginning, and there was some video released by law enforcement where it was clear that there was a white Elantra that was speeding through a, a video camera that captured it leaving that area. But uh, I would have to believe that I'm, I'm curious as to where this video came from and what's the source. And if it is tied to it, I've got to believe that there are a series of videos that they have been able to put together to show the movement of this particular car and recognizing it and identifying it as a suspect vehicle. Um, let me move on to another piece of sound. So this is now at 4.14.42 a.m. So this is about 10 minutes later, where you could arguably hear a dog barking. So Phil, what I heard was arguably the sound of one bark of a dog, and, and we have to remember why this is significant, is because we believe that Kaylee Gonsalves, one of the victims here, had a dog named Murphy. Now this dog, Again, the reporting indicates that the dog was unharmed in the room where Haley and Madison, they were found. Uh, investigators found possible animal hair or an animal hair strand from Koberger's home that hasn't been 100% confirmed. That has been uh, identified in earlier reports and earlier part of the investigation. I'd be curious if they've been able to confirm whether or not that was Murphy's hair. If it was, that's going to be a significant piece of evidence, the fact that he has uh, her animal, her dog's hair in his place. But... Ten minutes after the car pulls up, we hear what is arguably the sound of a dog. Your thoughts? Well, you, you know, there are affirmative in these investigations, and so I would have to say that the dog barking is consistent with information that we, we know. So, as you stated about Murphy, and, and we know that Murphy was there, we know that Murphy was unharmed. So, again, I mean, it's, it's, it's circumstantial. It is circumstantial, but it's pretty strong circumstantial evidence that I, I've never been a believer in coincidence. So on this video, if it's real, it is showing us that parts of this thing that are consistent with the evidence that we already know about. So we know that Murphy is there. Now we have a dog barking and then it stops. Uh, so again, Right now, we've got a pretty consistent timeline here about what we know and what this is purporting to project. All right, we're going to get back to Brian Koberger in just a second, but I do want to take a moment to thank our partner. Seeing that sound of a dog bark was at 
42 a.m. on the timestamp of this video, okay? Mm -hmm. At 4.14.56, only seconds later, you're going to hear what people say is a thud, and then at 4.15.03, okay, you're going to hear a second thud. Let's play both, both of those. Okay. So you have that seven second difference between those two thugs. <clears throat> no idea what that is. Remember, there's no indication that there were gunshots. There was that, that a, a weapon was, a, a firearm was used. It sounds almost like it was a firearm. No idea what that could be. What do you think? Well, again, we can't identify what well, we can't identify. So, uh, but if, if we understand the activity that is possibly taking taking place in this video again if it's credible then that would be somewhat consistent with somebody striking someone or something and again we, we've got a timeline here that seems to be projecting events that are consistent with what we know in the evidence thus far and, and I have to ask you, let's just assume for a moment that this is Brian Koberger. Let's assume that he is attacking one or two individuals at that point, those two thuds. The fact that the car arrives at 4.04 and you're hearing this about 10 minutes later, that is, feels very quick to me. No, I mean, you know, you would think that somebody, they were planning to commit a murder. Maybe they would take a little bit of time. Maybe they would... I don't know, 10 minutes to go in and do this. Uh, that tells me something. I'm wondering if what that tells you. Well, look, again, knowing what we know and all of the evidence thus far leads us to this defendant. And these things do happen quickly. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious to me, just looking at the evidence that we have, that, that, he went in there with a purpose. This was a planned event. He knew where he was going. He knew who he was going to. And so you, you've got to have this quick strike. And he and his, I'm no, I had no doubt what his plan was, was to get in, get it done, get out. And then he had some things. I, I think that Ethan, when he walked out into the, into the hall, at least from what I've read, I think that's where things went off the rails in terms of what happened to, to uh, him and, and, and the girlfriend. So he's on it. So, so far it, it sounds like it's, it's not what I would hate to think is, is that if law enforcement, I mean, that's where we're going to find out whether this is credible, right? When this thing comes to a trial, these videos are going to come out. What would be disturbing to me is, is if this is some sort of AI concoction, that somebody has put together to get their jollies in some weird perverted way. But I would have to say that the video itself right now, what we're, what we're hearing and seeing is consistent with what we know. Mm. I know I keep saying that over and over again, but, but it's, no, it's, I, it's important. I get, it. I get it. Look, again, we don't know what this video is. We, we have to be very yeah. careful. I just say it's pretty interesting considering the timestamps and what has been, as you said, consistent with what police have alleged. Now, I'm going to give the final three points of this, um, and we're going to play each one after the other, but uh, I'll tell you. So the first one um, is at 4.17.43 a.m. Again, you are going to hear what sounds like a dog. Let's play that. Okay, so that is about uh, two over two minutes after the thud. You hear that, but it sounds like a dog. Then at 4.21.01 a.m., you can hear what sounds like a car door shutting. Okay, so you hear the car door shutting, or what sounds like a car door, and then this car driving off. So you hear what sounds like a car door shutting, maybe, then a car driving off. You go back to the probable cause affidavit that I mentioned. They say that suspect vehicle one 
is next seen departing the area of King Road residence at approximately 4.20 a.m. at a high rate of speed. Maybe off by a minute or so, but that seems to be relatively consistent or whatever they say 420, maybe from a different camera. But again, that frame is pretty consistent as we've been talking about, Bill, uh, with their timeline as well. Your thoughts on the dog, the last dog bark, the door, door closing, and then only seconds later, uh, the car possibly driving away. Well, again, it's consistent with what we know in terms of the information given in the affidavit and the evidence we've or we're aware of the whole episode if we just use the, the time stamps on this video is what like 15 minutes right uh, i don't think it's much uh 16 much minutes. more than that 16 and, minutes is from when the car they say he got there and then he left right so when just he gets quit. inside when it, when they get inside you're talking uh the dog starts barking, or we hear the dog barking the first time at 4.14. Um, uh, so he's he's moved around, got the car parked, he's in the, he's in the house. And really when we talk about the time inside the house, we're only talking, what, 10 minutes maybe? Yeah. And that's, that's and, and, he's, and he's out by the time he did 4.25, by that 10-minute time period, he's out in the car and gone again. So what happens inside the house is really a tight time frame. So yeah. you don't have all this time going on inside the house. You've got the total picture, and you can explain where people are in that time frame. And so it actually is a quick. It's a quick hit if you if you look at the time that it's actually occurring. Yeah. So it's a very small window. Um, but then you have the dog barking as he's exiting, and then you have the the car door closing and the car taken off. So, gosh, if it's if it's real, it's pretty powerful stuff. It, it's very very powerful circumstantial evidence in the, in the whole big picture of of this incident. Chilling to say to say the best that this is real. It is again short time frame for four murders allegedly running into the surviving roommate DM uh, and and leaving up leaving. Um, but it also lets you know that. Again, speculating a bit, but if it was this quick, it wouldn't be surprising that he left something behind. And we always talked about that knife sheath with that police say his DNA is on. If this was that quick of a crime, killing four people on different floors of that house, running into one of the surviving roommates and taking off, I can't be surprised that the killer left something back behind. But again, this is purely speculative. We don't know this, the, the, this video hasn't been verified but it is just chilling to say the least. Uh, Phil, I'll give you the final word, but uh, again, thank you so much for coming on. Well, I, I would just have to say that again, if it is credible, if this is good, uh, good, a good piece of evidence, then this is just a snapshot of the, of the massive amount of evidence that's been gathered in this case. Yep. And it is just one piece of a larger puzzle. But this particular piece is, again, it's real is quite damaging, at least in my opinion, in the over, overall scope of the investigation. Phil Waters, thanks so much, my I believe it was a bit interesting. I like the fact that the former detective, Phil, said that it was difficult to know what make car it was from the video and I personally believe it was a car with tinted windows even the car that is speeding near the gas station that was captured on the body cams or no, sorry, not the body cams. It was captured on the CCTV of the gas station, the gas shop. That one showed a car that looked like a 2011 to 2013 model of a Hyundai. And it had tinted windows Jack D 
has a white Hyundai. I heard he sold the white pickup a week after the murders. We've seen that white pickup near many places, allegedly, near the corner club. I'm not saying it's the same white pickup car. I always believe in the Taylor Avenue footage. I never discuss much about the Linda Lane footage because the Banfield body cam video is important. Because to start with, we can confirm that it's legit because it's the police's body cams. But what I found interesting about the Linda Lane footage is you can hear a female yelling, stop it, stop, in the Linda Lane footage and from the body cam of the two police officers. So that just can't be a coincidence. But the woman who owns the Linda Lane apartments was in charge of the CCTV surveillance in a block, said that I told the police that it was a White car. She said, I didn't tell the police it was a white color car. I said it looked like a white color. She meant it was like cream, beige. Even a white and silver color could look like the same at night. I believe they got this car description from the gas lane footage from the gas shop footage definitely because after the shopkeeper gave it to them he saw it on the news when the police went to the gas shop to pick up the gas station the gas shop or gas station handed over the footage to Moscow Idaho police and detectives. I believe that's when they put out their description on the 7th of December. 7th of December was the same day that the police brought the U-Haul down to 1122 Kings Road and they gave the parents and the families back some of the stuff of the students, of their loved ones. I do understand parents would love to have the memory of the loved ones whose life was cut so short. But this is supposed to be a professional case. You don't give out any stuff till you're 100% sure that the staff don't have any forensic evidence. Some things can only see, be seen by a microscope. The crime scene was really misconducted. People were going in with a mask. People were sneezing. The officers, the forensic officers. The three unidentified male DNAs are lost, allegedly, because the, prosecution, the prosecutor, William Thompson, clearly doesn't know what happened to the three unidentified male DNAs. He said the FBI or the labs did not hand it over. But I didn't see the judge telling them to turn that over. The judge was just interested about the IgG DNA, the touch DNA. So I think they're going to bring all these pieces together, make build a puzzle out of it and say 
This is how he drove. This is when he went. This is how long he was inside the house. But that's not even going to help because they really need to prove it to the jury and to the judge. How did you get this man is DNA? Did they take the right precautions before they were, did it? Did they get it? Did they do it legally? What side did the FBI? use and for his phone pinging and stop pinging many people have bad internet connections and service connections in those areas Brian could have done it or Brian could be totally innocent. And you can imagine if thousands of us are baffled and asking questions, imagine how juries will come to agreement or come to the same page. I'm sure there are many that will still have reasonable doubts. And the main reasonable doubt is why did it take eight hours for the roommates, surviving roommates, to call the police? The police didn't even call them surviving roommates. No, they didn't call them witness. They did not call them surviving roommates. They said they were just there. Let me know in the comments section what you think about the Linda Lane footage. I find it really strange that somebody's yelling, stop it, stop. When the Linda Lane footage, it sounds, stop, please stop. But in the band field, we clearly hear it, stop it, stop. It could be stop, it, stop, please, stop. But it sounded like stop it, stop. There's something about the Linda footage, Linda Lane footage that I believe isn't completely legit. Could be someone trolling. Could be somebody in the neighborhood who wants to make a big change, who is good in technology. That's why I always follow my facts. When people pass comments about me and say, you don't need to be focused about the banfield and the grub truck and all that. And now they are discussing it. And I get so much rude comments for that. But I think I was going in the right track because although the 4chan is an anonymous po uh, poster and it ain't a fact, how can we confirm that it's a lie either, that it's false? Because a lot of things make sense. They said they would do it in 19 minutes. They said they would go without any mobile devices, phone devices, so they wouldn't catch the Wi-Fi. They said that when the lights go off on the second and third floor, they'll do it. They had motives. The couple and Maddie, they had targets. They had motives. They fought with the couple. The couple was not seen on any social media from 9 to 1.45. No pictures of them have been circling around. What happened at the Sigma fraternity, at the party? Where was Bet Bethany Funk? Where was Dylan? Was a boyfriend Quinn, Quincy there? Quinn Kelly? Because he was apparently seen there. She made all her pictures private from that night. A man with a mask was seen around King's Road. You've seen that picture of a man with a green hoodie jacket, dark green hoodie jacket and a ski mask where you could see on his lips and his eyes. There was so much floating in the start that the police started just debunking it without even checking. 
And I believe that something could be true about what we, was being debunked. Like the fact that many people from the university, from the college itself, said that they heard that it was an overdose that was staged maybe. And some people allegedly have other ideas of what happened, but most of them are trying to say that this happened between 3 to 4 a.m. And one of the other ones which I find really fishy, a red flag, is that the students were gagged. That didn't come from, those rumors did not come from social media, they came from the college. So was it an overdose? Kaylee's mother heard that Kaylee was shot in a party. Look at how many things was going on. The truth lies somewhere in between, I believe. But we saw a lot of activity between three to four. They changed the timelines to make it fit with the Hyundai, is what I believe. It was Chief Fry himself who said that the girls were just there. They were not witnessed. But after 49 days, they were made witness. And it was said that they slept upstairs. Dylan slept upstairs and witnessed everything. When they found BK, his white Hyundai, parked in front of his residence, Washington Pullman, and when they checked his driving license and all, they thought, oh, he has bushy eyebrows. So that's definitely the guy Dylan saw. Usually people see someone's eyes. It's scientifically proven. Eyebrows is not the first that is noticeable. And let's not forget, Dylan opened the door, not once, not twice, thrice, three times. So what happened? She opened the door three times. Wasn't she scared for her life? What was the reason? BK was seen around that area. Was somebody trying to frame him? It could be completely possible. Why not? It's not far-fetched. Because this man had no DNA besides the touch DNA which could have come from anywhere. It could have come from a third party. Somebody else could have brought the DNA by just saying, greeting his hand. But how come there was no DNA, forensics DNA of Brian Koberger and the four victims in his car? There was no DNA. In his house, none. In his office, zero. Nada. There was no DNA. And we're talking about a quadruple murders. Four murders were committed. He would have injured his hand. He would have had cuts on his hand. And why would he have hanged around in Moscow, Idaho, or Pullman, Washington, after knowing that he committed four horrific murders? He waited 47, 49 days or 45 days to leave this area. Why? What does Bethany Funk know that could exonerate him or basically give him a mistrial or give him a no, no guilty verdict? What does she know?
Um, you must have been following the latest news that BK's defense attorney is saying that BK wants transparency in this case. He wants everyone to see what is really going on. That's why I believe there's more to this case. And the judge ordered the IgG evidence, some of the IgG evidence, to be handed over to BK's defense team. But why some? Why not all? Is he entitled to a fair trial? Isn't that what it's supposed to be about? And the defense attorney wants to know a trial date. So do the families of these victims. Although the prosecutor wants the trial date to be set in summer while the colleges both in Pullman, Washington and Moscow, Idaho are on holidays. That I can relate to. It's not a crime to drive in front of or near someone's property because you could be going somewhere nearby the area. It doesn't mean he was going near King King's Road only. He could have been watching the girls for other reasons. He could have just been a peeping Tom without doing any crime. This man is getting the death penalty if he's found guilty. So he's entitled to a fair trial. We want to see the transparency. Thank you, BK. Because most of us are not criminal, criminology lawyers here, but we would like to learn about the legal system too. And we want people to follow the legal system, others it's going to be unfair. I personally believe there are more people involved. Everything happen around, happening around the grub truck wasn't a coincidence. I believe the girls were under surveillance. I believe somebody is watching them from the live stream of the Twitch video. I could see so many people passing signals to each other in the grub truck video. The boys on the Banfield video, I personally don't believe was just an alcohol stop. I believe it was more than that. I believe that somebody called the cops on those three boys to kill time, to buy time. I want to know where those four figures came from. I want to know why the boys were dressed with such odd clothes in the Banfield video. One of them, the tall one, looked like he had on female, a female shirt on. His pants looked like leggings. They were so tight. Something was not right in that Banfield stop. And the first thing that was not right is they refused to stop for officers. We heard female, a female yelling, stop it, stop. What was actually going on? Did something happen to couple the couple at 2, at 2 a.m.? Because Stacy Chapin said that 2 a.m. is the hardest time for them all. Is she talking about her family and Zana's family or all four victims' family? I wonder what results the private autopsy of Zana gave. Did Kaylee get the most wounds because she fought back or was she a target too? Could it be that the three girls were the target, the three other victims were the target of Sigma 
Chi fraternity and could Kaylee and Maddie actually be targets of Jack D and Jack S allegedly and Adam it's just so baffling because some, what was said to Adam I'd really love to know I believe it has something strongly in this case why was the Congalvis family pissed off upset clearly with Jack D in the beginning which was very obvious in the memorial too but later on everything was forgiven and they were supporting him why did the girls make 10 calls from Kaylee and Maddie's phone to Jack D why I hope we get answers to all these questions these gag offers need to be unsealed I've never seen a case with so much secrecy please like share and subscribe justice for the victims